Okay, so moving to the second question. This is the one that the mentors extracted from a number of comments and questions, and uh, they have sort of paraphrased it as follows. When someone has Alzheimer's disease, does the mind begin to disappear, or is it just the brain? There are really two aspects to that question. The first is the, this distinction between the mind disappearing and the brain disappearing. And then secondly, there's the specific question of what is lost in Alzheimer's disease and does this ultimately constitute uh, a, a, a total loss of mind, a, a progressive uh, process toward a total loss of mind. Addressing the first part first, uh, you know, is it only the brain that disappears as opposed to the mind? Of course, a, a basic premise of this uh, entire uh, course is that the mind is embodied and that we can't uh, have access to mental states. We can't speak of a mind um, without uh, speaking also of its physical manifestation or its physical realization, which, um, which uh, to the best of our knowledge, remember we're speaking empirically here, to the best of our knowledge, it can't exist without a, 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 an embodied brain. So when we speak of a disappearing brain to overstate the case as to what happens in Alzheimer's disease, we are of necessity speaking of a disappearing mind. Uh, and conversely, when we're speaking of a disappearing mind in the degenerative sense of the word, that it is lit literally frittering away, the actual ontological stuff of the mind is disappearing, then uh, this correlates with some parallel equivalent process in the material, physical object of the mind, that is to say the brain. Now that doesn't mean that all parts of the brain contribute equally to mental functions, and that's another very important subtext uh, or, or, or subsidiary theme uh, of this entire course, that we're trying to define which aspects of brain function um, are fundamental for mental function and which are not. That helps us to, un to understand. It's one point of access into this question of trying to understand what a mind is. Let me give you an example. You can remove the, the motor strip, the, the little cortical homunculus, um, on one side of the brain, I'm pointing to the right-hand side of my brain where my cortical homunculus is. This part of the brain controls the left-hand side of my body. Conversely, the, the cortical homunculus on the left side of my brain controls the right side of my body. Now you can remove that part of the brain and it will affect my control of the right-hand side of my body, but it won't have any effect on my mental representation of my body. Uh, it, it, it doesn't change my mental functioning one iota. In fact, the same applies if you go further forwards uh, into the into Broca's area, the part of the brain that's essential for producing language. Language being such a fundamental um, human cognitive capacity. I have I have worked clinically and studied scientifically innumerable patients with Broca's aphasia, with loss of the ability to produce language, and I would say that their minds. That is to say, their persons are not altered one jot. They are the same personalities that they always were. Now, go further forwards into the frontal lobes uh, or the prefrontal lobes, which are terribly important for executive control, for agency, to refer back to the four fundamental properties that uh, I enumerated earlier. These patients are radically altered in their personalities. There was the famous case of Phineas Gage who had a tamping rod shoot through that part of his brain and he made a perfectly, uh, he, he made a total physical recovery. His physician was astonished at how well he did physically uh, after such a major injury to his head. But his physician and everyone who knew him observed that he was no longer the same person. He was, as the famous quote goes, no longer Gage. In a case like that, we have to say that the damage to that part of the brain has altered the mind, and it's altered the mind in a very specific and, as it happens, predictable way. Because I have worked, again, clinically with literally thousands of Phineas Gages. That is to say, literally thousands of people whose personalities have been altered in exactly the same way that Phineas Gages was by damage to that particular part of the brain. So to sum up this first part of what I'm saying in response to question number two, uh, I'm saying you can't have a disappearing mind that doesn't have something to do with 
a disappearing brain uh, in the sense that the question is posed, that is to say, in regard to neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. Um, but that doesn't mean that these two things correlate with each other in a one-to-one -one simple fashion, that every square centimeter of brain equals one square mentometer of mind. Um, the, 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 the correlation is not, is not a direct one. I hope that's clear. Now to come to the matter of Alzheimer's disease in particular. It follows the same general principles that I've already outlined. It starts with the loss of a very specific mental capacity in the classical form of the disease. It starts with the loss of the capacity to lay down new memories, recent memory disorder, everyday forgetfulness. Um, the, this aspect of the disease correlates with loss of tissue, degeneration of tissue in a very specific part of the brain, in the, in the anterior aspects of the medial temporal lobes, an area called entorhinal cortex, which then spreads into the hippocampus, which is so important for laying down new memories. In the second stage of Alzheimer's disease, the patient loses, in addition to the ability to acquire new memories, they lose the ability to remember names, and that spreads to language in general. They lose substantial aspects of the ability to produce language uh, and to comprehend language. And then it spreads to spatial cognition and they start to get lost. They start having difficulty recognizing people. All of this correlates with the spread of the disease from the medial temporal lobes backwards to posterior cortex, uh, parietal and occipital and temporal cortex at the back of the brain. In the next stage of the disease, uh, it, it spreads further forwards into frontal cortex. Uh, and then you start to lose uh, general cognitive capacities and the executive control um, of, of cognition altogether. So I think it's fair to say that in such a process there is progressive loss of mind. There's progressive loss of mental capacities. But I would like to draw attention to something uh, specific about, uh, about this disorder and indeed about many of the dementing illnesses. That is to say that loss of cortex, which correlates with loss of cognitive capacities, does not, does not necessarily imply loss of mind as a whole. I think we're all too ready to equate mind with cognition. Uh, cognition is severely affected in Alzheimer's disease and progressively so, as I've said, from memory to language to spatial cognition to visual recognition to executive control, but there is still a sentient being there. All of us who have worked with Alzheimer's disease patients or who have relatives with dementias of the Alzheimer's type will attest to the fact that the person is still there. They are radically altered. Just as Phineas Gage's personality was altered by damage to a specific part of the brain, so too in cases of Alzheimer's disease, where a different part of the brain is, is progressively affected, so too a different aspect of the person is progressively affected, but it is only an aspect. Even when there is, when there is uh, stage four, the, lo the last stage of Alzheimer's disease, when there's massive degeneration of the cerebral cortex, the brain stem is still intact. And as you're going to learn in the third week of this course, the brain stem is very important for the generation of consciousness and for the generation of affect, of, 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 of emotional consciousness, feelings. And uh, that aspect of the mind is not lost in cortical dementing illnesses. So please remember this point. Loss of cognition is not the same as loss of mind. We are more than our cognitive instruments. And I think that that's a good word for what cognition is. Cognition is an instrument of the mind. Uh, cognition is not the mind itself. If we had to make a choice between affect and cognition and say which of these is more fundamental to the mind, I myself would plumb for affect. And that squares also with the hierarchy of uh, the, 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 the relationship between the brain stem and the cortex. All cortical functions depend upon the integrity of the brain stem. That is to say, all cognitive functions depend upon the integrity of affective consciousness. Without affective consciousness, without a sentient being present in the mind, no, amount of, no, no kind of cognition can exist. But the opposite does not apply. 
you can lose all uh, and uh, uh, the whole of cognition, as happens theoretically in the ultimate stage of an Alzheimer's disease process. There's still the sentient being there. What kills patients with Alzheimer's disease is not degeneration of the lower part of the brain, of the consciousness producing, feeling producing part of the brain, but rather um, uh, opportunistic infections, falls, uh, 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 that sort of thing. Um, I hope that that clarifies the second question um, about the relationship between a disappearing mind and a disappearing brain in these cortical degenerative illnesses.